I'll come back to chapter 22, part two, where we'll conclude the lecture for the statement of cash flows. Learning objective number eight, identify the financial presentation and disclosure requirements for the statement of cash flows. I4S and SB require certain disclosures on similar items, including the disclosure of significant non-cash investing and financing transactions, a policy on what makes up cash and cash equivalents, and a reconciliation of cash and cash equivalents to the balance sheet accounts. IFRS has more strict requirements related to disclosure of some items, including taxes, interest and dividends paid and received, and restrictions on cash and cash equivalents. Both ASPE and IFRS describe the indirect method as reconciling net income to the cash flow from operating activities. And some IFRS companies start with income before tax. Both standards require reporting of gross inflows and outflows and other significant requirements relate to financial institutions, foreign currency cash flows, and business combinations and disposals. Learning objective number nine. So actually, let's just back up there. So learning objective number eight, what really matters is that when we're preparing a statement of cash flows, we're going to have a section at the bottom called supplementary information. And there we're going to list out any non-cash transactions, such as buying, buying land in exchange for shares. We're going to put that down at the bottom in the supplementary information. And under IFRS, we also need to disclose taxes. We need to disclose income taxes and interest and dividends paid. So we're going to have that in a supplementary section if it's not clear from your cash flow statement. And you have seen that in the tutorial section as we went through some examples. Learning objective number nine, read and interpret a statement of cash flows. Where did the cash come from and how was it used? So the first step is, for investors is that they're going to look at the classification of each of the different subtotals to figure out where money's coming in and where is it going out. And then you can go through each section and try to understand what's happening with the cash flow. And the MDNA and familiar with the company's strategic direction is useful. Cash flow from operating activities shows the extent of receipts customers are able to cover the extent from which payments from customers or receipts from customers are able to cover payments to suppliers and employees. And the direct method provides more details about the sources and uses of cash. And the indirect method explains the difference between accrual based net income and cash based income. And users of the financial statements need to analyze the reasons for the operating cash flows and to assess if the cash flow is sustainable and if it's likely to be repeated in the future or if it's a one-time event like the sale of land. Cash flow from investing activities shows if the company is just maintaining its existing capacity or if new investments will increase its potential. So looking at what types of assets are being purchased, if there's investments in new technology and if the existing assets are being disposed of. Cash flow from financing activities shows if any changes took place in the firm's capital structure and whether the equity increased or reduced the claims of creditors in the future. So looking at how the companies raise cash and determining if there will be an increased demand for future cash for interest claims or debt repayments in the future. Free cash flow is a concept, it's a non-GAAP measure, but it's used by many companies to measure discretionary cash available for things like investments or paying dividends, retiring debt, et cetera. So free cash flow is typically calculated as net operating cash flow, less cash expenditures to sustain current operations. So basically how much cash do you have and how much do you usually need to run your business? Companies with significant free cash flow have a strong degree of financial flexibility and they can be uh, ripe to take on new opportunities even in turbulent times. Learning objective number 10, identify differences in accounting between IFRS and ASPE and what changes are expected in the future. There's no significant differences between IFRS and ASPE. Is that awesome or what? Um, they're basically converged. Um, there is a presentation difference for interest and dividends and there's a classification difference for interest and dividends, but essentially they're all converged. And IFRS does require slightly more disclosure around the interest and dividends received and the income taxes paid. 
There is some work being done around uh, cash flow statements by the IASB, looking at requirements to break out different things. And companies are encouraged but not required to provide a reconciliation of items such as long-term borrowings and lease liabilities. And that concludes part two. So as you saw, part two to chapter 22 is a lot lighter than part one. The main thing you need to understand in this chapter is how to prepare a cash flow statement. You need to be able to do it using the direct method and the indirect method. And you need to make sure you know what you need to include as supplementary information and that you can work backwards when you have information and when you don't. And hopefully you've achieved that through the tutorial sessions. And I do suggest that you look at the other links I've posted with more information about preparing cash flow statements.